Well, I'm so grateful you decided to join us on this Tuesday evening. Let's begin with prayer. Holy Father, we thank you for your blessing on us, the gift of the Word of God, and we pray that you would touch and transform our lives for the op through the opening of your Word. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, today we are going to do, well, I think it's kind of exciting. We're going we're gonna to learn a little bit about the English language and the Greek language in a little bit, and that's going to be a little bit fun. We'll try to make it somewhat fun. But we're also going to learn about your Facebook pages. That's right. We're going to learn about your Facebook pages. You say, that's in the Bible? Well, not exactly, but what I think Paul says here ought to apply to how we post on our Facebook pages. Because this is kind of the litmus test of our relationship with God. So you might want to brace yourself because you might take a look at your Facebook page and say, oh my goodness, it doesn't really reflect my relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm afraid for a lot of us Christians, it does not. In recent days, we have become so intolerant and judgmental and hate-filled against people who disagree with us, and we justify it for the craziest reasons. We say, well, they treat us that way. You will notice that Paul never gives us the right just because somebody treats us poorly to treat them back in the same manner. That's not a Christian way of responding. And so, yeah, we're gonna learn about your Facebook page today. You may or may not like it by the time we're done. But we are reading from Paul's book to the Ephesians chapter four, verses 25 to five two. And I will tell you, Paul, you know, uses a lot of what we call imperatives. Now, there is a download that you're welcome to take and download and print out as a JPEG under the announcement for today's Bible study. And hopefully this will be a little bit clear. Paul uses what we call imperatives. This is, by the way, a form of a verb. It's the mood of the verb. And you're like, what? Verbs have moods? Yes, verbs have four moods. You probably didn't know that. Maybe you don't remember your language study. Ver uh, verbs have the indicative mood. The indicative mood is in space and time. When we talk about what happened today or happened yesterday or what we're going to do tomorrow, we are using what's called the indicative mood of the verb. The imperative is, you know, that's, that, that's uh, what our spouses tell us. Or our moms, better yet, we'll, we'll say our moms. I, I don't want to get in trouble with my wife. My wife is very good to me, and by the way. But uh, my, our moms, when we get up in the morning before school, they say, brush your teeth, comb your hair, put on a clean shirt, change your underwear. Because, you know, if you get hit by a car and you get rushed to the hospital, you don't want these doctors seeing you in dirty underwear. I, I, I don't know, maybe your parents didn't say that. My mom did, but that's because she had, was an ER nurse at one time. So I don't know. I've never asked her what she saw that made her say that. Nevertheless, imperatives, where we tell somebody what to do. So we have the imperative mood, the indicative mood. We have infinitives. Uh, infinitives are the, the two. You know, I'm, my to-do list. I'm going to wash the dishes. I'm going to uh, comb my hair. So my mom told me, comb your hair. I'm going to wash my hair. I'm going to brush my teeth. Those are infinitives when we do that. And then the last is subjunctives. And we're actually going to look at that today, subjunctives. You're like, wait a minute, I'm in the Bible study today. and We're talking about Facebook pages. Yeah, that's kind of true. But these understanding these two things are kind of important. We aren't actually looking at these today, the infinitives and the indicatives. But Paul, <coughs> Paul his lesson for today uses imperatives, uses subjunctives. Subjunctives are verbs that are out of space and out of time. Um, you know, kind of what I wish might happen, but there's really no plan for it, and they're not in my linear time frame. I wish... You know, if I lift weights, if I lift weights, someday I might become a bodybuilder. Okay? So if I lift weights, that would be a subjunctive. I'm, I'm thinking of something that could happen in the future if I dedicate myself to this, or might happen if I, if I do this, maybe this will happen. Those are subjunctives. They're, they're, they're verbs that are out of space and out of time. There's no time frame for them. They're not past. They're not present. They're not future. They're just 
wishes <laughs> and hopefulness. <clears throat> Paul uses both the imperative and the subjunctive in our lesson for today. And if you download this handout, you'll see why. And you're going to see in a minute why it affects our Facebook pages and how we talk about one another and how we ought to do our politics. All of these things I think God needs to touch and transform because we are not behaving in a manner that is suitable for one who calls himself or herself Christian. So let me start with the context of this, and we'll get to those infinitives or imperatives and uh, subjunctives in a minute. We'll explain it. Don't panic. Paul calls us in previous chapters of Ephesians to be one. There's no longer Jew. There's no longer Gentile. We are something brand new. We are one people followers of Jesus Christ. Therefore, so we are one, therefore, this is what he wants us to do. And now we get to the imperatives of Paul. Therefore, if you are a follower of Christ, if we are to be one with each other, this is the way that we need to behave towards one another. So the very first thing, so what we'll do is I'm going to put all of the imperatives in blue. Speak. Not just speak, but speak the truth of one another. Stop lying about one another. Stop twisting what the other person has done. Speak the truth. Always in love, however. Okay? Let me read it to you. Because again, I'm just, I'm reading from my, my handout, but I think it's important, first of all, let's hear it from the scriptures. Verse 24. Therefore, Put away falsehood. Let everyone speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Give no opportunity to the devil. Give no op uh, let the thief no longer steal. Rather, let him labor, doing honest work with his hands, so that he may be uh, able to give to those who are in need. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for edifying, as fits the occasion, that it may, uh, that it may impact grace, impart grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander be put away from you. With all malice, be kind to one another tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Okay, seriously, people, do your Facebook pages reflect that? Don't think so. We post such crap about each other. He says, speak the truth to one another. Don't be no anger. Well, okay, that's not true. He says be angry. And actually, that's an imperative. He says it's okay. Be angry. There are things worthy of being angry about. Okay? Um, a child who dies of starvation because we didn't care enough to make sure that child had enough food to eat. That's worthy of being angry about. Somebody who has molested your daughter or tried to impose themselves upon you in some demeaning manner, worthy of being angry about. Okay? What are we angry about on Facebook today? You're not a right-wing Christian. You're not a left-wing Christian. You don't have my politics. How stupid are you? We are angry about things that are not worthy of being angry about. Just not. Not worthy. Be angry about appropriate things, but this is do not sin. Well, if you're angry, anger is the way we create a barrier around ourselves to protect ourselves from being harmed. 
Being a Christian doesn't mean that you have to allow yourself to be a doormat. So anger is the opportunity to create a barrier around myself that says, I won't be treated that way anymore. But he also says, do not sin. Okay? In fact, do not let this, do not let the sun go down on that anger. Deal with it. Create that barrier. Be angry. Say, what do I have to do to protect myself and my family? And then let it go. So if you're continuing raging on day after day after day after day after day after day after day, the same dang thing on your Facebook page, you haven't let go of your anger. Protect yourself. Fine. But you keep posting the same crap day after day after day. You're not letting the sun to go down on that. You're, well, that sun is going down and you're still angry. This is what Paul is trying to say. When that happens, now this is my word here, when you let the sun go down and you're still angry and you keep rehearsing that anger over and over again, it becomes bitterness. Nobody wants to be around bitter people because they're not attractive. They aren't representatives of Christ. Okay. Got to keep going on. What else does Paul say? No. <laughs> no stealing. Okay. You, you think that this would be common sense. Don't steal. Rather, labor. Um, you know, we could get really sarcastic about jokes, about politicians, but, you know, whatever. Okay, no stealing. Rather, put your attention into laboring. If you spent as much time laboring as you did trying to find ways to steal from people, you'd be better off. But, you know, the problem with a thief is a thief never has enough money to share with anybody else because it's all about themselves or self-consumed. So, Paul uses a subjunctive here. Don't steal labor so that you might give to the poor. Okay? This is a subjunctive. So the result of not stealing and laboring is a subjunctive. That day that you fulfill these things will be the day that you will become a generous and kind person and share of your labors with the people who are in need. Okay? So then he goes on. What's the next one? Do not let, do not come out unwholesome words. I knew it's odd, but that's kind of the way the Greek says it. Do not let, let come out, or do not let unwholesome words come out of your mouth. Rather, and here he uses another subjunctive again, give grace. Seriously, people, look at how you post and talk about each other. Oh, they're sheeples. They're stupid. Can't believe they believe that way. We treat each other with such rudeness and such unkindness. Don't let these things come out of your mouth. When, because what should come out of your mouth, again, that's why the subjunctive, that's what the subjunctive is for. Let you know what should be. It isn't, but it should be. The day that you stop treating each other with such unkindness with your words, instead what's going to come out of your mouth is grace. You're going to speak grace, and people are going to be built up by your words. That's what it means. Your mouth is going to be speaking. Grace means gift. I shared this with you last week, the word cariz. Oops. Which is, by the way, the same word that my daughter's name, Carissa, is built upon. Cariz is gift or grace. So let coming out of your mouth, you should be giving gifts and grace for the building up of those around you. If the building up of those around you isn't happening by what comes out of your mouth or on your Facebook pages, it is not worthy of Jesus Christ. Okay? Be angry, but don't sin. Don't allow it to be building up into bitterness. Instead, let grace 
come out of your mouth. Okay? Let's go on. Go on. Paul's not done. He isn't done. Oh my goodness. He's got, what, 10, 11, 12 different... I know we have 10 listed here, but notice again, they're within the context of these uh, other imperatives that Paul is using. So again, give grace. Number six here on your list. Oh, uh, we're doing blue. Do not grieve. No, that doesn't mean do not grieve about people that you lost. He's not saying, he's saying do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Okay? What does that mean? The Holy Spirit is trying to change your life, and we are so belligerent. We don't want to change. We want to hold these things from God's transformation. You are being belligerent. We are being belligerent. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Rather, remove. Another, allow the Holy Spirit to work in you so that you might remove. Oh, listen to what he says. Okay? Bitterness. Wrath. All things on your Facebook page. Remove these. Anger. Again, he said, anger, be angry, don't sin. So anger that leads to bitterness. Clamor, slander. Oh, one of my favorite <clears throat> sarcastic ones that I see Christians saying is, oh, those Muslims, and they start using these really derogatory words about Muslims. The Muslims, by the way, not Muslims, and slandering people who are serving in Washington because they're Muslims, they're welcome to be in the United States of America. We are a secular country of religious people, okay? And we allow people of different religions in this country. They are a part of the fabric of our country. We don't slander them. They're people. Remove all malice from our lives. Okay? We need to remove these things. This is how we don't grieve the Holy Spirit. We let the Holy Spirit help us that these things might be removed from our lives. It's a process. It's a process. We don't arrive all at once. And then he says, be kind. Be kind. To one another. Actually, I, what, the word kind, and I remember I, I, we learned this verse when I, this is one of the verses that I had to memorize when I was in uh, elementary school at church. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as Christ, as God in Christ has forgiven you. And, and, and it's, it's a really, really beautiful verse, and it's a wonderful verse to, to memorize, and I think it's a great verse to teach children. I'm so glad I learned it. But be kind to one another. The word kindness actually comes from a word that means to be useful, to be serviceable to you. So it's not just, oh, I'm going to try to be nice to you. No, it, kindness means I'm going to be here to serve you, to be of service to you, to be purposeful in my presence in your life in a way that builds you up. That's what kindness means. Compassionate, he also says, compassionate. Oops. Could erase that and put it in black. Well, think of it in black because we need to keep moving on. So be kind, serviceable, useful to the other person, compassionate to them. And then here is where the rubber hits the road. Because if you do the following things, you will do all of those things. Become. What are you supposed to become? Imitators. of God. What? Your posts. How you treat other people. How we speak of other people. Can you hear this coming out of the mouth of Jesus Christ? Chances are no, and if you're finding a way to justify it, God really needs to touch your life. We need to be imitators of Jesus Christ. And then, I love this last one. You know, walk around. This is, this is one of my 
By the way, this is one of my favorite Greek words, peripateo. Uh, walk around, peripateo. It is, it is such a fabulous word. You know, um, I, I can't remember how uh, walk in Christ, I think, walk in Christ and so forth. Walk in holiness is how it says it. Walk in, in holiness is how it's usually translated. But there are other Greek words for walking. It says walk around. Walk around. It's like being uh, in Australia. You know, you do a walk around, mate, and you walk around uh, Australia. And, uh, you know, you just go and see everything. All right? So you'll do a walk around, but you're walking around life. That's what he's trying to say. You walk around your entire lives, not just from point A to point B, but in all the journeys of your life, wherever you go, you're walking around in holiness. Now, you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm not an imitator of Christ completely in my life, but this is the objective, okay? And sometimes we as Christians don't even have that objective in mind. We act this way in church towards one another, kind of, in a very passive-aggressive way sometimes, but we go home and we post all types of crap about each other on our Facebook pages. What the heck? We go and we, we say all sorts of demeaning things about people who disagree with us. We get involved in political races. I'm telling you, I don't know in the context of politics today how Christians could be right-wingers or left-wingers. Because both are incredibly rude and unkind and unchristian, and uncharitable in how we speak about one another. And we justify it in so many ways that Paul never gives us the option. He doesn't say anywhere in here, be kind to one another. Unless they're not kind to you, then you have a right to treat them like garbage. He doesn't say that, does he? Be kind. Become imitators. Now, I know in certain other religions... You are to treat kindly the people of your faith, but then you're allowed to lie and tell untruths and treat people who are not in your faith in any way you want. That's not Christianity. Christianity, whether people share our faith or not, whether they share our values or not, whether they share our ideas or not, we become imitators of Christ and walk around in holiness. Just as Jesus Christ did, while we were yet sinners, he didn't come down and say, oh, you're sinners, so I'm going to treat you like rubbish. He said, while you're at sinners, I will give my life for you. Be imitators. Walk around in holiness. Haven't arrived. But in the Christian life, this is the objective. This is what we need to open ourselves up to, the transformation of the gift of the Holy Spirit. I am seriously giving you an assignment right now. If you have posted, whether you're right wing or left wing, or you both are so unkind to other people on your Facebook pages, I want you to go and eliminate every unkind comment and every unkind post that you have made. It's my assignment for you today. Eliminate them. X them out. And apologize to the people that you've treated rudely. That's what I'm asking you to do. Be an imitator of Christ. And in the future, when you're angry about, and sometimes justifiable, about a political decision or some other decision that some other group of people is making, it's okay to be angry. But how do you avoid sinning? Well, you avoid sinning by, first of all, not posting that dang post. Okay? Stop. Don't post it. Reflect upon it. Pray about it. How am I as a Christian supposed to reflect upon this? It's okay to be angry, to protect myself and my family, but then how do I post on this and say things in a way that's an imitator of Christ? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, oh my goodness. We pray for your spirit to come and touch and transform our lives. Uh, you know what, my life too. I, it, it's so easy to go there when there is, of course, sarcastic and angry and, and to give in to that bitterness and rage over and over and over again about the people with whom we disagree. We're always going to disagree with people. We need to find the way to love. 
amidst these disagreements because that's just the church. And we need to find a way to disagree and love people who are not part of the church, even more importantly. And so, God, we ask your touch and your transformation that we might be imitators of Christ, that we might walk around in your holiness. For you ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.